Testament or the Hebrew scriptures, 1 Kings chapter 2, verses 10 through 12, and then chapter 3, verses 3 through 14. Hear this good word. Then David rested with his ancestors and was buried in the city of David. He had reigned 40 years over Israel, seven years in Hebron and 33 in Jerusalem. So Solomon sat on the throne of his father David, and his rule was firmly established. Solomon showed his love for the Lord by walking according to the instructions given him by his father David, except that he offered sacrifices and burnt incense on the high places. The king went to Gibeon to offer sacrifices, for that was the most important high place. And Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on the altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream, and God asked, Ask whatever you want me to give you. I'm sorry. Ask whatever you want me to give you. And Solomon answered, You have shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You have continued his great kindness to him and have given him a son to sit on his throne this very day. Now, Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father, David, but I am only a child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, Since you have asked for this and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have you asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment and administering justice, I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor ever will be. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, both wealth and honor, and so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. And if you walk in obedience to me and keep my decrees and commands as David your father did, I will give you long life. So there is a reality in the universe, and we hear this message from many different sources, but basically we get what we ask for, whether it's conscious or unconscious. We get what we ask for. Jesus once said, where your treasure is, your heart will be also. So whatever it is that you treasure the most in your soul, there you will your heart will be as well, and therefore it will be mirrored in your life. Years ago, I read a book by Tony Robbins called Awaken the Giant Within, and Tony Robbins is one of these persons to help you realize your dreams and your goals. And at the time, it was a very helpful book. But I remember one story in particular that really stuck with me after all these years. And the reason is is because at that time in my life, I really didn't think I deserved anything really good. And I felt selfish by even asking. So I had a lot of bad in my life at that time. <laughs> but one of the things that he shared in the story was this. He says, after he had established success in his life, he was in New York City and he was walking down the sidewalk in the streets of New York City. And as he was walking, a man started approaching him, and he says it was one of those things that you could tell that life had been very hard and difficult for this man, and he just sensed the man was going to ask him for help. So he determined before the man approached that he was going to give him whatever he asked for. And at this time, he had a lot of cash in his pocket. He said, if he asked me for $100, I'll give him $100. If he asked me for $500, I'll give him $500. So sure enough, as the man approached, he said, excuse me, sir, but can you help me? And Mr. Robbins said to him, Sir, I will be glad to help you. I will give you anything that you ask for. What is it that you need? And the man says, I need 25 cents to get a cup of coffee. And Tony used that as a metaphor in his teaching that so often people live in such desperate need, 
situations is because they ask so little of life. Over the years, I have learned to ask for more from God and to have a great desire to be able to serve more, to serve more effectively. And what we have in the story is a new king whom scholars believe that Solomon was established his, his, his reign when he was around 15 years old. He was a teenager. And here he is in this situation of incredible power and incredible wealth too. But he didn't know the ins and outs of what it meant to be a king. And so as he was in sleep and in a dream, God came to him. And God asked him what he wanted. Now, a little backstory on Solomon. Not all of you may know that story. I tell you, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings are wonderful reading. It's as good as any novel you're going to read about anything. But Solomon was David and Bathsheba's second child together. You all know the story of David and Bathsheba, right? That's pretty well known. Well, David, when he was king grew rather bored, I think, because he was so used to conquering people and winning battles and leading men. So one night on his palace walls, he was walking about and he saw a woman bathing in the, in the cover of night. And he thought she was the most beautiful woman he had ever seen and he wanted her. And when you're king, you usually get what you want, right? So he had her summoned and she came to his bedchambers. He had sex with her and then he sent her on home because kings can do that. And lo and behold... Bathsheba sends word to the king that she's pregnant. Now, we know it was David's child. How do we know that? Well, Bathsheba was married to Uriah the Hittite. He was a foreigner who lived in Israel, and he was totally committed to David. He was totally committed to Israel, and he was in David's army. So what do you do when you have all the power and all the wealth, and you've been caught in something naughty? You cover it up, right? And so that's what David attempted to do. So he contacted Joab, who was his general, who was his henchman, who was his man to take care of all business that was ugly. And so he asked Joab to have Uriah the Hittite just send him home in hopes that Uriah would go into his house, lay with his wife, and then everything would be covered up. Everybody would just assume that the child was, was his. And when Uriah was summoned by Joab to go and do this, guess what his response was? How can I go home and enjoy the comfort of my house and the love of my wife when my comrades in arms are out here lying in the fields? Absolutely, I will not go and do that because it would be betraying my fellow soldiers. Okay, plan B. David soon learns that loyalty has its prize, right? Plan B, I'll have a feast in my palace. We'll, enjoy, we'll invite Uriah. We'll feed him great food and we'll get him drunk on wine. After he's had his fill of food and wine, we'll send him home. He'll enter his house and then we can cover this thing up. So Uriah comes and he has, he's sitting at the king's table and he's feasting and drinking. He's filled with wine. He's drunk. And when he gets back home, does he go inside to his wife? No, he sleeps on the porch. You know why? Because how can he enjoy the comfort of his home and his wife when his fellow <laughs> in arms are out in the fields? All right, plan C. David Simons Joab. All right, send some of our soldiers to charge one of our enemy's fortresses. Make sure Uriah is in the front. Joab says, I can do this. And sure enough, they did exactly that. And Uriah, along with many other of his fellow soldiers, were slaughtered and slain that day. And the offensive was for no particular gain other than for David to cover up what he did. After the news of Uriah's death came, David had Bathsheba 
come and join his harem. Uh, we're talking about hundreds of women and concubines. Hundreds, maybe a thousand or more. That's a lot of women in one man's life. All seemed well. Bathsheba gave birth until one day the prophet Nathan comes to visit the king. Those pesty prophets. <laughs> Nathan comes up to the king and he says, King, I need to share with you a story about two of the people in your kingdom. You need to know this if you don't already. Okay. Yes, Nathan. Tell me what it is. Well, you have one man in your kingdom who's very humble and he lives very humbly. And he has, and he lives alone and he has one ewe lamb that he loves. He says he does not feed or fatten this lamb in order to eat it and slaughter it one day. But this lamb is like a child to him. It's a beloved pet to him. And it brings him so much joy. And you have another man in your kingdom who's extremely wealthy. And he has thousands of sheep in his, in his flocks, thousands. And one day he got news that one of his friends was coming for a visit and they were going to plan a great feast. And so this wealthy man who had all these thousands of sheep went and took that man's one little ewe lamb and slaughtered it and fed it to his guests. When David heard this news, he was outraged. That man deserves to die. And Nathan the prophet looked David right in the eye and he says, you are the man. David knew he had been caught. He did not cover it up. And unfortunately, that's typically what happens to powerful people when they try to cover things up, isn't it? it eventually, it comes to the surface. I've always said that the crime is usually worse than the cover-up. I mean, the cover-up is usually worse than the crime, right? The baby dies. And the scriptures tell us that David believed that God killed the baby because of his sin. Well, David and Bathsheba have a second child, and that would be Solomon. So God comes to Solomon in a dream. I love that part of the story. I'm one of those persons who has very vivid dreams and I typically remember them. And because of that, one day I asked a friend, you know, are there any good resources on dream work and everything? And I was introduced to, to Carl Jung's books, his writings. And I've studied a great deal on dreams and interpretation of dreams and how dreams work. And one of the things that I have discovered in my own journey is that for me, dreamed, dreams are a way for our soul mind to connect with the divine. There's, there's, nothing, there's nothing to distract. When we're asleep, our ego minds can't get in the way. So it's just that pure interaction with that part of us which is eternal, with that which is divine. So when God came to Solomon in a dream, God asked Solomon, Solomon, I've got $500 of cash in my pocket. And I'm going to give you whatever it is you ask for. Anything that you ask for, I am going to grant it to you. And Solomon's response in his soul, right? This is soul work. In his dream, his soul mind said to God, give me a discerning heart and help me to understand clearly right from wrong so that I might be able to rule your people justly, right? This was his request, a discerning heart. I'm fortunate in the sense that there are two dreams that I remember that were very powerful for me in this last year and the two are related. I've kept dream journals over the years, and I find that there will be like series, there will be like themes and motifs in dreams as I write them all down and I see, okay, and then once I understand the message from those dreams, then those dreams will stop and another series will start. But I had two dreams in the last year, 
And one of them came at the end of October of last year. At this time, I was experiencing severe symptoms with pain in my hands and my shoulders and my knees and my toes and everything, which reminded me a great deal of when I had polymyalgia rheumatica back in 2008 and 2010. I thought it had recurred, right? Typically, I would have symptoms, but then they would go away after three or four days. But these just continued and kept getting worse. And so I decided to call and make an appointment with a rheumatologist. The one who could give me the appointment the quickest was a month away. One of them offered one in March. That was the other second closest one. And on the night before I was to meet with my rheumatologist, I had a dream. And in the dream, a messenger came to me. And the messenger said to me, you have rheumatoid arthritis. And I started to weep. I said, my life is over. I will be crippled by this and I will not be able to create art. So how I responded in my dream. And the messenger looked at me with compassion, but no judgment. And the messenger says, I want to remind you that your, fam your most favorite oil painter and impressionist, Auguste Renoir, created his masterpieces while being crippled with arthritis. And at that moment, in my dream state, I thought, you're right, my life is not over. And I had my visit with a doctor, and she diagnosed me with rheumatoid arthritis. And that's what I've been struggling with now for almost a year. I've had one treatment that didn't work, and I've started a second treatment that is too early to tell. But along with all that, many other worries, economic, COVID, a compromised immune system, all kinds of things that were heavy. Our church, things heavy on my mind. And about a month ago, I had another dream that's related. And in this dream, I was like 1930s in, in France, in Paris. And in this dream, I was hanging out with some of the most eccentric and lovely and fun people I'd ever been with in my whole life. All ages, from young to middle-aged to, to elderly people. Just, and we were eating and drinking and dancing and smoking and, and celebrating life and listening to music and having incredible conversations. And it seemed that this dream just went on and on and on and on. And when I woke up, my response was, thank you. I thanked my soul for giving me this opportunity to experience this joy and fun. So this is a way that I believe that the divine connects with us is through dreams. Because Solomon was not selfish, God granted him what he asked for. Solomon had a very successful reign. That's unusual if you think about it in world history. Typically you have a very successful father and those who follow are not quite as successful. But David ruled over 40 years, and, and Solomon also ruled 40 years. And throughout his reign, he was able to build up the coffers of Israel. He continued to create, to manage a united kingdom, the Israel and Judah. He was able to build his military. He had equipped them with the best equipment. And he also had a huge cavalry and chariots. Now, yes, I know you're all thinking in your minds, ooh. But most of the enemies that they faced only had infantry. And if you only had infantry and you were sending in people on horses and in chariots, that's like people with handguns meeting tanks today. So he had this huge arm. He built the temple, the first temple in Jerusalem. And it was considered an architectural wonder at that time. It was beautiful. It was set way up high on a hill. You can see it even today when you see where the Alas Mosque and the Dome of the Rock is in Jerusalem. That's where it was located. He was brilliant at negotiating and diplomacy. And he be was befriended by the Phoenician king who took him under his wing to teach him how to be king. And the two of them together built ports of entry for trade. They created trade routes with other countries. He married women from 
other countries to bring them into his harem. He had 700 wives and 300 concubines. That's not bad, is it? He even married Pharaoh's daughter, which sealed his alliance with Egypt. So he was brilliant at what he did. And he had a long life. And he had wealth. And he had everything that he had asked for and more. And his wisdom was renowned throughout all the region. In fact, the queen of Sheba came to visit him because she wanted to meet this man who had this reputation of being so incredibly wise. So we get what we ask for, whether consciously or unconsciously. If you're a person who in life unconsciously and consciously don't believe that you deserve anything good, you will create situations in your life and draw people into your life that will validate every one of those beliefs. If you're a person who's living a life in this world that in spite of what's going on, you think that life is miraculous and beautiful and you just want to do all you can to contribute to it, you will attract people into your life who will validate that and you will create that world around yourself. It's amazing how powerful we are that way. So, I'm going to ask you to join me now on doing a little exercise. First of all, in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. And when you close your eyes, I want you to focus right here. Even though your eyelids will be covering your eyeballs, you know, I don't want everybody to open your eyes and you're looking cross-eyed, right? That's not what we're asking for. Just focus your energy right here to the center of your face, right here. Right? So everybody close your eyes. And now just focus right there in the center, right there where your sixth chakra is, right there in the center of your head. And I want you to take a deep breath. In Greek and in Hebrew, there is one word for breath and spirit. In Greek it's pneuma. In Hebrew, is ruach. So when you breathe, the breath of life, you're also breathing in spirit. So breathe again. And while focusing right there in the center of your forehead, I want you to go into an imagination of dreaming. Just imagine that you're in a dream state and however you want to be on a beach, sitting on a park bench, hiking in the mountains, whatever it is that, that just meets your need at this moment. And while you're at this place, you see a figure coming towards you. And this figure is going to be God. So just use your imagination how, this, how God presents God's self. As an angel, a messenger, a thought, a creature, whatever. And as God comes to you in your soul mind state, in your imagination, God's going to ask you this question. Ask from me whatever it is that you want and I will grant it to you. So what is it? What do you tell God? Right. Open your eyes. What was the first thought that came to your mind? Chances are, that's where your treasure is. That's probably a good clue about what it is that your soul really desires. What was your second thought? That's an important question as well. Did your second thought confirm and reinforce your first one? Or did it discount it and try to find out ways to undermine it? You know? That's important to know too. When I was in a period of great transformation in my life in 2007, I had the great privilege of having a wonderful mentor named Patricia Smith. And she worked with me for two years because it took that long. <laughs> <clears throat>
And I remember one of my most powerful lessons, and this is going to be familiar to some of you, but some of you are new. One of my most powerful lessons is her teaching about have, do, and be, or be, do, and have. And she shared with me that most people in the world live in this formula, have, do, and be. For example, if I had a million dollars, I could do these things and I could become this person. And what she taught me is that the opposite is what is really true. Who do I want to be? And have clarity on who do I want to be? And then what must I do to become that person? And the have will take care of itself. And I went through that exercise and I can tell you that it worked mir miracles in my own life. And it still does. What we see in the story is that Solomon at a very young age knew clearly who he wanted to be, not what he wanted to have. Solomon wanted to be a man of a discerning heart with clarity about right and wrong and to be a just king. That's who he wanted to be. He did the things to reinforce that and then God granted him all the other stuff that he did not ask for. And I'm sharing with you today that take some time this week. Find your quiet place this week. Take some time to know quiet place and go into a meditative state. Do whatever it is that you need to do to find complete quiet and connection with God. Let your ego mind go. It's going to tell you this is silly. We know nothing good can ever happen. Or we can ask until the cows come home, but it's not you. No, you, that's the ego mind discouraging you. Your soul mind knows who you are. It knows what purpose you came here to fulfill. And when you are in touch with who you want to be, then it's easy to define what you need to do to become that person. And God will grant to us the same that God granted to Solomon. When we are clear about that, God will provide the have. And it will go well beyond anything we had ever imagined. And when you're in that quiet moment, and you have this clarity, and God's spirit with your spirit shares with you, this is who you are. And you confirm, yes, this is who I want to be. Then trust it. Trust it. Trust the response. Because it comes from a realm that is eternal. And way beyond anything that we experience on this planet. Trust it. And then go about becoming that person. And we like Solomon, will experience life in a way that is so powerful and wise and discerning and beautiful that we'll never be without, we'll be fulfilled, and we will be a part of fulfilling God's grace in this world. Go with peace and purpose.